All right, Discovery, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house. You ready for the Word of God today? We are in our summer series where we're studying the book of Ephesians uh, for the next five weeks now. It's going to be a six week series, and I'm excited about it. I love to change the pace in the summer and do a little bit different type of study and a type of teaching with you guys. For those of you who have been at Discovery for years, you know I like to teach in different styles and methods. We'll do topical and, and, and character studies and different things like that, and, and at least every year we'll take a book of the Bible, and we'll go through that, and what we're doing here is we're going verse by verse through the book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians, rather. And so we're going we're gonna to read through all of chapter 2 today. So I hope you, come on, how many of you brought your Bibles? How many brought your Bibles? How many of those Bibles? Come on. So in this series, if you were here last week, I told you, come on, bring your Bibles to church. This is one of those series. I don't want to be the only one studying the Bible. I want you to study the Bible as well. I want you to open up to the book of Ephesians with me. I want you to grab, if you don't have a study Bible, buy a study Bible. I'll show you the one I brought today is the archaeological study Bible, okay? This one's unique in that every, all those notes in here are about the archaeological discoveries and the historical nature of certain texts and, and the accuracy of it. And so it's a really cool kind of an apologetics historical look on the scriptures, which is really cool when you're doing something like this and looking at um, an entire book. So find one that's right for you. Bring it to church. If you, uh, if you don't have a Bible, get a Bible. And if you can't get a Bible, let us know. We will get a Bible for you. Jump right now in your notes to, or in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. We also have these notes. I, I make it easy for you all. I'm still going to do it. So if you want to be lazy, you can. All right, just grab these notes. I'll have all the scriptures for you as well. We are actually going to read every, every verse in Ephesians chapter 2. How many of y'all ready for the Word of God today? Okay, that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to... I'm just going to just, just let the Bible teach itself today and bring context to the Bible. Maybe draw some insight out of the scriptures, show some things to you, bring some revelation to you today. But I'm just going to let the Bible preach for itself and read through these verses and share some insights with you. Um, last week, or actually today, uh, we're in part two, Ephesians chapter two. And I want to, before I jump in, let me just share with you the outline like of Ephesians 2, give you kind of the big picture of what Paul's doing and where he's going so that we can kind of read it with a good, a good mindset, okay? So, so let me kind of, this is in your notes, but here's how Paul starts Ephesians chapter 2. He starts with how God changes our life. That's what he's going to begin. He makes us alive and starts to change our life, and he's going to tell us how God actually does that. How does he change our lives? And then he's going to tell us the, the process by which God makes peace with us and he allows us to make peace with others. That's what we're going to turn it into. Follow along with me. Process of peace. Process of peace. There you go. Thank you so much. And those things, those things together, those things together, ultimately, is, it's going to, for the purpose of creating a new family, okay? The whole purpose of Ephesians chapter 2 is that God wants to create a new family. How he does it? He changes our life. He makes peace with us and others, and he creates, in fact, that's the name of today's sermon is New Family. God wants to create a new family. Okay, so similar to the beginning of the letter uh, of Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul begins, if you were here last week, by the way, if you weren't here last week, you got to go catch that out, check it out, because in, in chapter 1, I explain who the author is, the purpose of Ephesians the context, uh, who the letter is written to, and all of that is, is important information when you're studying a book of the Bible. Now, I want to give you good, good stuff about Ephesians, but I hope, to, I hope in this series my main goal is to, is to get you in love with your Bible, to desire it, okay, but also to help you understand how to study the Bible. And those are important things if we want to study the text. So go back, watch, watch message number one, part one, and this because every, every other message and chapter is going to build on Part, uh, uh, part one of the foundation that, that Paul set there. But in part one, in Ephesians chapter one, Paul begins, remember, with this long praise. He's got like 12 verses. In the Greek, I told you it was one long sentence full of like spiritual depth and insight and truth that Paul wrote this psalm. He does the same thing 
in Ephesians chapter 2, he begins with seven, seven of our verses. In, in the original language of Greek, it's just one long sentence filled with spiritual depth and truth and insight that we're going to look at today. In Ephesians chapter 1, the first truth, the primary foundational truth that he began with was God has chosen you. That was the main truth in chapter one. God has chosen you. And then every other thought that he brought in was based on this foundation. You are chosen by God, okay? And because you're chosen by God, this, 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 this. And that's how chapter one was broken out, okay? Chapter two begins the same way where there's this first thought. He's gonna begin, and I'm gonna show you. The initial thought of chapter two, and then every other thing he mentions is based on this initial thought. So in chapter one, his initial thought, God chose you. In chapter three, in chapter two, write this down. He wants you to know God has not only chosen you, but sin is working against you. Will you write that down? God chose you. But in chapter two, he's saying, now you need to understand, sin is working against you. Now, when we say sin, um, I, some, you know, <laughs> some, some of you tighten up and straighten up and get all kind of squirrely in your seat and stuff like that. It, 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 it's not as... Uh, as painful as you, you think. You know, it's not just the individual actions. Let me say it like this. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. It's important to understand of what type of sin he's talking about here, the Apostle Paul that we're going to get into. It's not just the actions of sin he's talking about. He's talking about the condition. In fact, write it down somewhere like this. Sin is not just our action. It's our condition because of our position. Okay? We are, this is our condition in human nature in the world system. Sin is not merely individual acts of wrongdoing. It's a pervasive condition affecting all of humanity. It's a systemic issue rooted deeply in humanity and in the world system that is corrupt that we live in. It's important to understand what the Apostle Paul is about to tell us. Sin is not just actions. It's our position in the world. We are born sinners in a sinful world. Amen, somebody? We got to understand that. Ephesians chapter 2. Let's start with verse 1. As for you, the Gentiles living in Ephesus, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. So everyone else used to follow that way. You used to follow them just like that. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now here he's referencing, this is, he's talking about Satan as the ruler of the kingdom of the air, meaning that this world system that we are positioned into as humans, we are under the dominion and the rule. The system of the world is under the dominion and the rule of Satan. And we have to recognize that. And the Apostle Paul is letting the Ephesus, Ephesus believers and us today know that in this world, the world system, the ruler of it is Satan. If you don't recognize that, you're going to fall for some schemes over and over again. If you don't realize that's the entire world system, everything rooted in this world system is rooted in sin and has its dominion under Satan. Every system, media system, political system, I don't know, music, every system of this, of the cultural system is rooted in this world and therefore under the dominion and rulership of Satan. Very important to understand. This is what Paul is making the case, that you used to be under the rule of Satan, positioned in this world under his rule. All of us lived among them. Who are the them? Everyone who was living like that, right? Everyone who was disobedient, living that way. At one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature, so meaning by our position, just by our humanity, we, are, we sin because we're sinners. By our nature, we're deserving wrath. He says we, we're fo we follow the cravings, desires, and thoughts. Everyone who's like struggle with addiction to drugs will tell you that the first encounter with that drug, whether it be heroin or crack or alcohol, that first encounter is a rush, but afterward, it ceases to be fun. It's no longer fun. From then on, the addict is just killing the pain. And sin is like that. At the first time, it's whatever it is, greed, lust, lying, whatever it is, the first time, it's a thrill, but after that, it becomes a tyrant. You don't use it, it uses you. 
You follow its desires and cravings, okay? But you're not, a, you're, you're not sinners because you sin. We are sinners because we sin because we are sinners. We are born into the world system of sin. Very important to understand this. Let me give you a key thought um, in, in this section of, of teaching, you guys, of Ephesians chapter 2. Write it down somewhere. Your geography determines your identity. Your geography determines your identity. So when, when the Apostle Paul is talking about being positioned in sin and positioned in Christ, he's referring to an identity based upon your geography. Let's go back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, um, there was, your, based upon your geography, if you were not part of Israel, you didn't have the identity of Yahweh. Now, remember what I was, I, I actually taught you guys this several weeks ago, that the geographical lines of the nations were dispersed and are under the rulership of heavenly hosts. Demonic beings rule over certain geographical areas. Okay, that's happening. That's, there is principalities and authorities in the heavenly realms. So there is that war that is happening geographically. Okay, but in Israel, there was Yahweh was the leader. So, so depending on what land you're at, what geography, no, 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 I'm talking about identity. I'm, just, I'm not talking about your intrinsic identity. I'm talking about like, you're born in America, you'll always be an American, right? No matter what country you go to, you will always be an American. So your geography determines your identity. So how does God change us then? How, are we, how do we become changed? Here, here's how. He changes your geography. So what you're going to see, and I'm going to show you in advance here, we're going to continue to read Ephesians chapter 2. You are now in Christ, you are seated in heavenly places. And because your geography has changed from the citizenship of this earth and under the realm of this system, you are now seated in heavenly places and have a new ruler, which is King Jesus. Okay? So how God changes your identity is he actually changes your geography. You look all throughout the scriptures, um, like when God created the nation of Israel, what did he do? He called Abram out of a land and brought him into a new land. He changed his geography and then created a new identity in people based upon, like he was, he was a Chaldean, but because he changed his ge geography, God changes identity. Okay, so when we talk about being positioned in Christ and positioned in sin, it's not just the action he's talking about. He's talking about the position, your, 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 your location in. So when you're positioned in Christ, you're seated in the heavenly realms. The Holy Spirit rules your heart, and you will bear fruit of the Holy Spirit in keeping with the kingdom of heaven. When you're positioned in sin, your ruler is Satan, and you will bear fruit in keeping with the world of sin. Which, which is why 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, when people keep on sinning, it reveals they haven't changed their geography. Their location hasn't changed. They're still bearing fruit from the ruler of the kingdom of the air. They're keeping sin. Their geography hasn't changed. They're revealing, it says, that they belong to the devil. True believers transformed and relocated into Christ's kingdom will live differently because their nature and their governing influence in their life has changed. Our new location in Christ means we're no longer under the dominion of the world and its rulers. We are seated in heavenly places, locating and ide indicating a new identity and a new authority in our life. Amen. Come on, amen, somebody? Colossians chapter 1 says it like this. For he has rescued us out of the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom. That's where we were. We were in this world system, positioned in this world under Satan's kingdom, and brought us into heavenly places, the kingdom of his dear son. So here's the initial thought. Paul says there's actually four different works he's going to bring us through on how God works out this transformation and change in our lives. The first foundational work, he says, sin is working against us. But, write this down, God works for us. Can I get an amen, somebody? Sin's working against us, and we don't, we're not big enough or bad enough or strong enough to defeat sin and conquer sin and rule over sin. Thank God he works for us when we could not work for ourselves. Ephesians chapter 2 continues, look at verse 4. And because of his great love for us, God. Some of your translations actually say it like this. But God, because of his great love. 
but God. Those are my two favorite words in the Bible, but God. It basically means it doesn't matter what anyone else does. If God is for me, who can be against me? See, the the truth is we can have peace and joy and hope even during the hardest times, the most painful times, if we really believe God's word more than we think or feel or put hope in our circumstances. But God, because of his great love for us, who's rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Our spiritual geography determines our identity. Being seated in heavenly places with Christ breaks the power of sin. And our new nature and governing influence comes from God and not from the world and the dominion of darkness anymore. Okay? But here's, let me, then he continues, in order that, or that, that language is so that. So he did all that. He changed you. He saved you by grace. He seated you in heavenly realms so that in the coming ages, God might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to you in Christ Jesus. Here's what that means. God changing your life, making you alive, pouring out his grace and loving you is strategic from heaven's standpoint. You are a brand ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, and God wants to show the world his kindness, his love, and his grace through your changed life. It's strategic. God saved you strategically. It wasn't just for you. Sin was working against you, but God works for you. And it wasn't just for you. There was was so much more to this. God was working so much more. Look what it says. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Our salvation is not based upon what we can do, what we can earn, or what we deserve. Thank God for that. It is based on grace through faith, believing on Jesus, not by our works. We can't boast about it. Sometimes, like, we'll begin that way. We begin giving our life to Jesus. We're at at this place where we recognize, like, I can't save myself. But somewhere along the way, a lot of people's faith turns into something that they try to work out themselves. It's like, I got to earn it now, and I got to deserve it now. And a lot of people I talk to question their salvation. Am I really saved? I don't know. I mean, you read that scripture about people who continue to sin. Is, 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 is the devil my daddy, pastor? Tell me. Is the devil my daddy? Am I saved? And so we, we, we struggle with this, and we just have to, look, the reality is we got to stick to the word of God, you guys. Not about what our feelings say. Remember in Luke chapter 22 where that thief on the cross tells him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus was the miracle worker. I mean, he could have said anything, right? Take me down from this cross. Get me out of this situation. But he didn't do that. He recognized his greatest need was salvation from his sin in a home in heaven. And he knew Jesus could offer it. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And, and, and Jesus didn't didn't tell him to do anything and to uh, perform anything. He just simply told him, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. How do we know, how do we know, like, for sure that you're saved? How do you know you're going to heaven when you die? How can you be certain without, like, and eliminate all doubt? Because assurance of salvation, if you desire that, it's not by what you do, because you can't earn it. It's not from your feelings, because your feelings can go up and they can go down. How can you be sure? You have to trust in the word of God. If God said it, then that settles it. It is by faith you are saved through grace. And this is not something you can do yourself or else you'd boast. In fact, let me show you Ephesians chapter 2, that, the 8, 8 through 10 in the message paraphrase. I love how it puts it. It says, saving was all God's idea and all his work. All we do, look, here's our responsibility. We just trust him enough to let him do it. Can somebody say amen to that, okay? It's all God. He just, all you got to do is trust him. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go going around bragging what we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. It's God who's working for us, because we couldn't work it out ourselves. It's almost comical how some people try to like prove their worth to God, their salvation to God. Like some people try salvation by subtraction. You know, 
I just need to stop doing this certain bad thing and that thing and hope maybe God will forgive me if I just, if I just remove, subtract some things from my life. Or some people do subtraction by, by service. If I be nice, if I be good, if I get baptized, if I help the old lady cross the street or something, I don't know, if I, if I just do enough good things, maybe, maybe God will save me, I'll go to heaven. Some people do salvation by comparison. The reason why some people, maybe even in here today, aren't Christians is because you know a Christian that you think you're better than. You're like, honey, you like him. Why do I need that? Okay? But, but none of those options work. None of those will make you right with God. Not being bad won't get you to heaven because the Christian life is, is more than just not doing bad things. Service doesn't work because you can never be good enough to please God. And comparison doesn't work because Jesus was the only perfect person and the only one worthy of the sacrifice. There's only one way we can receive the grace of God. Believe on Jesus. It is by faith. Through grace, you are saved. That's the power of grace. Grace is threaded all throughout this letter. It's going to be threaded all throughout this chapter as well. So how does God change our lives? Sin works against us, but God works not only for us. Write down this next, this next work. God not only works for us, but God works in us. It is God who is working in in you. He didn't just work for you, but now he's working in you. He is the active agent changing your life. You don't change you. God changes you. You didn't change yourself. You can't change yourself. You can't make yourself more like Jesus. You can't transform to become more like Jesus. That is a work of God in you, in us. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork is the word there. The Greek word there is poema. It's where we get the word poem. Did you know you're God's poem? Some, some translations say masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. That, that this means that you were created with intentionality, with craftsmanship. It means that you're not just random, accidental creation. You are designed on purpose with care. God works in us. He didn't just work for us, but that transformation work is God working in us. Jesus said it like this, apart from me, you can do nothing. You cannot, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can bear no, no fruit, but remain in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit if you remain in me. Philippians chapter two, Paul says, continue to work out, not work for your salvation. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, how do I work it out then? Okay, let me work for it. Let's work this salvation out then. What do you want me to do for it, God? Can I be better for you? Can I do things for you? Look what it says. For it is God who's actually working in you to will, that's your desires, and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So, so you, it's, it's not you. It's not you. It's the Holy Spirit in you. He changes your desires, your will, your heart, and even influences your actions to please his good will. Work out. So, we're, when he says work out your salvation with fear and trembling, here's, here's, it's said this way. We work out what God works in. We'll work out whatever God works in. For example, because the Lord first worked into me in understanding of Ephesians chapter 2 or Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 and 13, because he first worked that in, now I'm working out my salvation as I wrote it out and I declare it to you. I'm working out my salvation. If we're going to be used by God, you got to acknowledge that God is already at work in you. He's already at work in you, and he's already at work around you. You're not the active agent of change. You didn't initiate the change. You didn't start the change. Not in you, not in this world. Now, that's important to understand because where, where the apostle Paul is going about this transformation, it's not just that, hey, sin's working against you, but God wants to work for you and in you. It doesn't end there, Okay. Because the transformation is complete, not just when God works in you and for you, but write this down, but when God starts to work through you. God wants to work through you. And we have to understand that the active agent of transformation and change is the Holy Spirit by the grace of God. Because if you don't understand that, then you're going to try to work for God on your own merit on your own anointing, on your own ability. You think it's you that's doing something as if you were special. You are not. I am not special. I am not. In his eyes, I am. But all the good work that I do is because of the work he's doing in me and through me. 
Let me show it to you. Verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay, if I, if I forget it's God working in us and through us by his grace, if, if I forget that, then I'm going to start to work in vain and operate under the, if I operate under the perspective that salvation and healing and freedom and deliverance and all these other things hinge on my ability and anointing, then I'm going to achieve nothing of eternal value. The reason why God changes you, though, the whole purpose of God saving you and changing you was to equip you to be a difference maker so that you would do good works that he prepared in advance for you. That's actually one of the purposes of reading and studying the Bible, that you would actually be prepared to do the good works God has called you to do. That's why I want you to know this. That's why I teach it. That's why I give you handouts. Because this, this word prepares you to do what God has already prepared for you. Let me show it to you in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful, look what it says, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. This is what the word of God, it's what it does in our life. It not only teaches us, but how many know we need to get rebuked by the word of God sometimes, okay? That we need, it needs to hurt, like, oh, like I was going one way, I was thinking one way, and the word of God, the truth rebuked me and brought me back into alignment. It corrected me. It is training me in righteousness. Why? So that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every, what, for every for every good work. This is the purpose why God changed you and saved you and inside out transformation is not just that we work in you and for you. He wants to work through you that you would be the brand ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. So God, this, so God changes us. He makes us alive. And then the apostle Paul tells the church in Ephesus the process by which he makes peace, not only with God, but with others. And then he's going to explain some theological terms. I'll break it down with you guys. The process of peace, where every one of us are in one of these three stages that the Apostle Paul is going to list here. And I'll listen for you, the three stages, this process of how God is making peace. Every one of us are in one of these three stages because God has already initiated the process to make peace with us. You may not even started to make peace with him. You may not even thought about him or looked in that direction, but God has already started to make peace with you. Okay, the process of peace is already started. So we're all in one of three stages, and Paul's going to break it down for us. Here's the first stage. Separation is the first stage. That's where all of us begin separate from God, dead in our sins, the Bible says. Because of our sin, remember, not just our actions, but our condition. You might even be a good person. Oh, they're a great person. They're just generous. They but if they're apart from Christ, if they're not in Christ, and they're in the world system, they are separate from God. Let me, and because they're separate from God, Isaiah 59 and 2 says, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. It's not very popular to talk about this in our culture today, to talk about sin separating us from a holy God, like Jesus being the exclusive way and that, and that only in Christ, that good person and other religions and all these things, like, nope, that ain't going to do it. It's, it's very, it's, we get the whole, how can you be so narrow-minded and bigoted to think Jesus is the only way to God? In our culture today, the exclusivity, the ex exclusivity of Christ is very offensive. People get offended at that. But if I say to you, two plus two equals four, not five, not three, does that offend you? No, because it's a truth claim. If I say you can jump off a four-story building and not softly, you ain't going to softly land on that concrete. You're going to splat on that concrete. You are going to get injured, maimed, maybe even die. Does that offend you? Hopefully not. It's just a truth claim. And so when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's not narrow-minded. He's not bigoted. He's not intolerant. He's just simply speaking the truth. And in order to, listen, in order to be changed, in order to be transformed, in order for this peace to be worked out in your heart, you have to first realize we are separate from God. Our sins have separated us from a holy God. Not just our actions, our position in the world system, our condition of what we are born into, I am separated from God. Let's see how Paul says it. Verse 11. Therefore, 
He's talking to the Ephesian church, remember? Remember, he wants them to remember this. Don't forget this, man. You guys might forget where you came from and start acting different, trying to prove it and do it yourself. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. You didn't have, you didn't have the circumcision, the, the, what does it say, the circumcision? You didn't have, you were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners of the covenants of the promise. You were without hope and without God in the world. So in verse 1 through 10, here's what we see. Jesus sets you free from sin and death by making you alive through faith in him. But that's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story that Jesus just makes you alive and changes you. God is doing something so much bigger. He's bringing all people, Jews, Gentiles, all people, bringing them together as one in Christ. And he's calling all the people to remember where they've come from. That we as Gentiles, and Gentiles, by the way, just means non-Jew. That's who many of us in this room are. We are non, we are Gentiles. That we, Gentiles, did not have the circumcision. We didn't have citizenship in Israel. Remember, geography determines identity. We didn't have Yahweh. We were not citizens of Israel. Okay? We didn't have the covenants because of that. They had the covenants. Sometimes we talk about circumcision in this context. A lot. Of, I know that it's different in our cultural context because when, when he's like, we didn't have the circumcision, she's like, I got the circumcision. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm there. I'm good. I'm in that one. You know what I mean? So in, in the context of Ephesians here, I think we need to understand that that wasn't the cultural norm back then. It was a norm for Israel. And it was part of their covenant. It was actually one of the signature signs of the covenant between Yahweh and Israel was that they would be circumcised. And, and the spiritual significance was this. It, was the, it wasn't just the cutting away of physical flesh. It was a symbol of cutting away of your carnal nature and being made new in, in God. That was, it was a symbol of that. And it was a symbol in that culture because it was very different and not normative that these people were different. They were different. They were marked by God, okay, physically and, and spiritually, okay? So, so this is the first thing, the first stage or the process of peace that we recognize we are all separated. It's separation. Number two, the second stage is reconciliation. A, a, a biblical word that simply means to be at peace again. That's what that word means, to reconcile, to be at peace again. It's bringing two people or groups together to restore peace. Let's look at it in verse 13. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Look what it says, for he himself is our peace. See, Christ doesn't just bring peace, he is our peace. So anytime you're lacking peace, listen, when you are lacking peace, it's, it means you're lacking the presence of Jesus in your life. Because when you have God's peace, you have Christ. And when you have Christ, that means you have peace. Here's why this is so important to understand, because this is the, the way the enemy deceives and attacks. He wants to rob you of your peace. Why? To get you out of position and away from power. Remember, geography determines identity, and he wants you not operating from your seated position in heavenly realms under the lordship of Jesus, bearing fruit of the kingdom of heaven. If he can deceive you, rob you of your peace, he can take you from the presence of God, literally take you seated from the heavenlies, not operating there, operating in the worldly system that he is Lord of. Are y'all seeing this with me? See, some of us are deceit, like we're, we don't have peace in our soul, in our minds. Some of you don't have peace with your brother, your sister, you got offense, you got bitterness, you're playing into the enemy's hands. You are, you are, you are being deceived. You are lacking power now because you are not operating from your seated position in heavenly realms. You are operating under the dominion of darkness, although you don't belong there. You're not a citizen there, but he pulled you there. Well, seeing this with me, okay? Ephesians chapter 2 continues. Um, who has made, for himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. He's talking about this, this the division of cultures and races and ethnicities that existed there between Jews and Gentiles and Grecians and, and, and slaves and free people. It was just, how many of you know it's still bad today, okay? There's still a lot of division and hate. And anytime, anytime that you operate from this, you pick a position in the worldly system. You pick a side, oh, I'm this and I'm that and I'm this. You have now picked a worldly system and have left your position in Christ. 
I'm not saying you cannot have opinions in Christ. I'm not saying you cannot operate in this world. I'm saying, that's all I'm saying. I'm just saying when you ascribe yourself to a position, a world in the world system, and then and not in your superior position in the kingdom of heaven, you are, you are out of position. And you cannot operate from a place of power. So, so he says he has torn down the barrier. That wall of hostil- hostility, it's a, it's a cool picture, an analogy or a metaphor of, of just anything that separates us and God. Actually, I have a picture I want to show you of the, um, the temple because the wall of hostility is an actual wall that the Ephesians would, would know. Gentiles would understand the, the wall of hostility that was torn down because this here, this outer court, this is the temple in Jerusalem. The outer court was the, was the court of the Gentiles. They were allowed to go here and this is where they would like sell stuff for the offering and sacrifices. They would like make trade in this place, which was, which was authorized. And they were allowed to go there. But they could not go inside the holy place or the holy of holies. They could not enter. That was only citizens of Israel could enter. Israelites could only enter. So they could not. There was a wall that was separated, a wall of hostility literally separated them from the presence of God and walking in unity with the people. I was studying in my archaeological Bible this last week, and I came across this, uh, this, this excerpt about the wall of hostility, and they actually found an archaeological like discovery of a plaque that was on the wall that the Gentiles could not cross. And it actually said on this plaque that the wall would be in, in the temple of Jerusalem. It says, no outsider, this is what the plaque said, no outsider is allowed to enter within the barrier surrounding the sanctuary, punishable by death. So this was, I'm just trying to help you see it in context of how these Gentile Ephesian people would see the scripture. When he's talking about the wall, that barrier, that wall of hostility being torn down and creating one people, they would, they would clearly see that as the wall that separated them from the presence of God and being in unity with their brothers in Christ, the citizens of Israel. Okay, This is what they, this is what they would see. That wall has come down in Christ. By setting aside, here, let's go back to the text, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself, look what his purpose was, To create one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. He wanted to make a new humanity, a new creation, a new people out of Jew and Gentile, out of of humanity, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death the hostility of division that is seen between groups of people, ethnicities and cultures and groups, God put to death that and created one people in Christ. Okay, so so if we're following this process of peace that every one of us are on, the stage of this process, some in separation, some in reconciliation, this scripture, it's beginning now to get into the third stage of peace. Write it down like this, is unification. Unification. This is God's ultimate goal of what he was doing. Remember the title of the sermon, all to get to this place of a new family, right? God was, his whole, his intention of changing us from the inside out, bringing peace with us, between us and him and us and our brothers, that God was creating unity in the people, uh, in the believers that would call him Lord. Let's continue. Ephesians 2. His purpose was to create in himself a new humanity out of the two. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. He's using language very intentionally. Foreigners, fellow citizens. Okay, this was a big deal in Ephesus. It, to, to be a Roman citizen in Ephesus meant, meant a lot of privilege. It meant if you were a citizen, you could vote. You had a right to fair trial. You could own property. If you are not a citizen, which was a coveted thing to be a citizen in, Eph- in Rome, to be a Roman citizen was something you, it was hard to get. Very co- You could not get a fair trial. You could just be accused and, and thrown. You had no defense. There's like, so there was, it was very good. You get, you get safety. You get identity. You get security. You get belonging because you're a citizen of this Roman nation, of this, of this nation. Okay, so he's using intentional language. He says, look, you used to be a part of these people, but God has divided that wall. He's tearing down the wall, and now you are fellow citizens with God's people. Write it down like this, because there's three things that God is trying to unite. 
three things. Number one is one nation, that we would become one nation. Nation That we're no longer outsiders and foreigners, but fellow citizens with God's people. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 declares, we are citizens in heaven. That our citizenship is in heaven. This citizenship isn't based on our earthly nationality, but our heavenly geography. We are seated in heavenly places. And this citizenship comes with it identity and calling, blessing and inheritance, and the power of the Holy Spirit in the kingdom of heaven one nation. That's what God is united. That's what he's calling. He's calling, just like he called Abraham, Abraham out of the Chaldeans, the land of Ur. He's calling you out of your former associations, of your former lifestyle. Though you used to live like them and worship like them, he's calling you out of them and out of that, whatever you were positioned in, calling you out and making you into a new people, one nation. Verse 19 there's a few more things that we're going to unite here. Verse 19, and also members of his household. So he was not only creating one nation, but he was creating a new family. Write it down, one family. I talked about this last week. But not only was God trying to create one nation, that was his goal. His whole goal was saving you and changing you from the inside out and working out peace between him and God and you and, his, you and your brothers and sisters was not just to create one nation, but to create one family family, that you would have brothers and sisters in Christ, spiritual sons and daughters and fathers and mothers that you would have. And not to say that your earthly family is of no significance and value. Paul's going to talk about that in Ephesians chapter 5. We'll discuss the responsibilities we have according to the kingdom of God and his word to our earthly families. But in chapter 2, he's trying to let you know, in order to become this, this new creation, you got to come out from your old lifestyle, become a new nation, become one family, and then let's see the last one in the last few verses. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two, here's the key, are being built together, not individually, but together, you people of God, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Here again, Paul is, is trying to bring our attention to the, the unity of the body of Christ, that there is this individualistic pursuit possibly that we have, a very selfish pursuit, a, maybe even a, a Christian. You have a form of Christianity that does not reflect the word of God here, that you are, you're, you're kind of rogue. You got no you're, you don't got a one nation, one family thing. You're just like, oh, I'm part of the kingdom of heaven. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ here. And, he's, and he's, this flies in the face of your false theology that wants to just live and do whatever you want. It flies in the face of that because that's not the Christianity of the Bible at all. The Bible says that the reason why God saved you and brought you out not only as one nation and one family, but that you would be built together as one body and that the Holy Spirit would dwell amongst the body of believers as we come together. One nation, one family, write it down, one temple. One temple. Yes, you, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, I get it, but what you need to understand is that you are, not, you are not an adequate temple for the full glory of God. You are not. It was always God's plan that you would come out from wherever you were living in, whatever position you were in, that you would become a new nation, a new identity, that you would get new family members, brothers and sisters in Christ, but that you would be built together in the body of Christ, God's church, that you would have a church that you worship, that you call home, that you call your brothers and sisters. Yes, you have brothers and sisters all over the place, but that you would have a local family to call yours. That was always God's intention and design. That's the New Testament. This Americanized version of Christianity is not the Bible. You are meant to have a church that we together would be the temple of God. Not just individually, but us together would come and the presence and the glory of God and the spirit of God would dwell in our midst as his church, as his body. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.